Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. So in this third and final lecture for connective tissue proper, we're going to go through some high yield clinical pearls that apply many of the concepts that we've discussed in the previous two lectures on connective tissue. So first, achondroplasia. This is due to a mutation in the FGFR3 gene, which codes for the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, which is a protein that contributes to collagen synthesis and maintaining collagen structure, and it is continuously active. Now, it's also as a result of contributing to collagen synthesis and structure, it's involved in the process of laying down cartilage during fetal development, which then becomes bone. This is one of the processes of developing bone. And as a result of this being continuously active, it actually inhibits chondrocyte growth. And the chondrocytes are cells within cartilage that are responsible for synthesizing new cartilage and maintaining the cartilage which then would indirectly contribute to the process of cartilage becoming bone. So if you decrease this, then you're going to decrease bone development. Another thing is you're going to decrease endochondral ossification as a result of this as well. And this is the process by which cartilage becomes bone. And so that's affected as well. And this affects longitudinal bone growth, especially bone growth in the extremities, such as the femur or the humerus. And as a result, the clinical features, they're going to have short limbs, and then they're going to have a large head and torso relative to the rest of the body. And then they'll have a decreased height also as a result of the shorter limbs. Last thing I'll point out here is the inheritance is autosomal dominant. All right, so next we'll talk about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is also labeled like this, is produced in the liver. It's an enzyme produced in the liver and it inhibits proteases, but it mainly functions in the lungs. So it's synthesized in the liver and it makes its way to the lungs. And what it does is when it's in the lungs, it decreases elastase activity or inhibits it. And so elastase breaks down elastin which is a critical component of lung tissue because it helps it make it elastic and carry out its function of breathing. Now, elastase is typically, in this case in the lungs, secreted by neutrophils, which serves an immunological function. And so that's okay, but you don't want to secrete too much of this or have too much of this around because it's going to lead to breaking down of lung tissue via breaking down elastin. So this is kind of just a check and balance situation here. Now, the problem is, is when this is decreased, as a result of a mutation, so you have a deficiency of it, it's going to result in increased elastase activity. So as a result, you'll have increased elastase activity, and then you'll have increased breakdown of elastin in the lung tissue. And so that's going to cause these patients to end up developing emphysema earlier in life because they're going to have breakdown of the supporting tissue of the lungs. Now something I want to point out briefly here is, is you can have different forms of this disease, one that are less severe and then forms that are more severe. So the less severe forms, you have about 40 to 60% of normal levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And in these patients, if they don't smoke, they can often lead a normal life and have a normal phenotype. However, if they smoke, that can increase the inflammation. And then actually cigarette smoke, so smoke increases inflammation, so we'll just say increased I, and then it inhibits directly alpha-1 antitrypsin. So it has that double effect here. So if they smoke, it exacerbates the situation. And this can also lead to these patients developing early emphysema. And then there's another form, which is more severe, where they'll have about less than 15% of the normal levels. And so for these patients, it doesn't matter if they smoke or not. Obviously, if they smoke, it's going to be much worse. But if they don't smoke, they still develop early emphysema. This disease also exhibits codominant expression, which means multiple versions of the gene are expressed, and then the phenotype will show both of these versions. And like we said, this can lead to early panacinar emphysema, which then results in developing early chronic obstructive lung disease, or COPD. And this is what causes early mortality and significant uh, limitations for these patients as well. Anatomically, it affects the lower lobes of the lung, so sometimes that can be asked. 
Now, one thing I'll point out before going over the clinical features is as a result of mutation in this protein, you're going to have misfolding, and specifically misfolding and accumulation in liver tissue where it's synthesized. And this will lead to liver disease or cirrhosis. So even though this enzyme is active in the lungs, because it's synthesized and it, it becomes mutated and it accumulates, you can develop emphysema and cirrhosis. And this can be how you can recognize this on an exam. So often if you see a patient, you know, in, that is young, so let's say, you know, 30 to 40 years old, could be younger, could be older, and developing emphysema and cirrhosis, or they're exhibiting symptoms like this of, of emphysema, such as barrel-shaped chest, breathing through pursed lips, enlargement of air spaces, and difficulty breathing, then you want to be highly suspicious for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Even in patients that are normal, that heavily smoke, they usually don't develop emphysema until much later in life. They usually don't develop it in their 30s and 40s. And so if someone's in their 30s or 40s, and they're starting to develop significant symptoms of emphysema, you want to be very suspicious for alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then if you throw in, they also have liver damage as well, then you want to be definitely very, very suspicious for this disease, for this diagnosis. Osteogenesis imperfecta, this is due to a mutation in the COL1A1 or COL1A2 genes. And these are genes that are responsible for collagen synthesis, specifically collagen 1. So in these patients, you have decreased synthesis of collagen type 1. This is an autosomal dominant inheritance. And this disease is an example of locus heterogeneity. So what does that mean? If you have, you can have multiple different mutations, and they can sometimes be, even be on different chromosomes. So they could be on the same chromosome, or they could be, even be on different chromosomes. So this mutation, this mutation, even though they're in completely different locations, hence locus, they still result in the same phenotype. This is known as brittle bone disease, and the reason for that is because type 1 collagen is such an important part of bone matrix formation. So if you have decreased type 1 collagen, you're going to have very improperly formed bone matrix. It's not going to form that nice compact structure that helps bones with their you know, structural component and function. And due to that weakness, the, these following clinical features can result such as hearing loss due to abnormal formation of the ossicles, which are the ear bones, such as the stapes, teeth defects because collagen type 1 is such an important component of that compact structure of a tooth. And so if you have decreased collagen type 1, you have defects in the structure of a tooth, of their teeth. Blue sclera of the eyes because the connective tissue of the sclera is composed mainly of collagen type 1. And so if that's missing, um, that you have clear connective tissue over the veins in the eye, and so that's where you get that blue coloration. Numerous low energy fractures due to weak bones. So as a result of having these weak bones, um, they're more prone to fractures, even in injuries that would normally, in a normal person, would not result in uh, a fractured bone. One thing here, though, on your boards, it's really important to differentiate osteogenesis imperfecta from child abuse because they can have a similar presentation. So high energy fractures. So unfortunately, children uh, that are being abused can often present with these fractures, but it's going to be more so high energy uh, falls and things like that or, or physical abuse. They will not have blue sclera of the eyes, unlike osteogenesis imperfecta. They won't have teeth defects. And then obviously genetic count, uh, screening will help with differentiating them. So these are some important things, the blue sclera, the teeth defects, and then obviously genetic screening that can help differentiate these. And then typically, if they give you the nature of the injury, osteogenesis imperfecta is going to be more likely it's going to be due to low energy mechanisms of, of injury versus more so high energy mechanisms of injury will be child abuse. All right, so elhurst danlos syndromes. So this is a group of syndromes. Um, that have a common theme of having mutations in genes that encode different subtypes of collagen. So it depends on which genes affected and thus uh, which type of collagen. It can be type 1, 3, 4, 5, or even a combination. Um, depending on what types affected and, and other aspects of the disease, the inheritance is variable. So it can either be autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. And so the common theme across all of these syndromes is that collagen is not properly produced. So if it's a gene that encodes for type 1, 
uh, type one collagen is not properly produced. If it's type three, then type three is not properly produced and so on. And then as a result of that, that type of collagen um, can affect any tissue that structurally involves that type of collagen. So if it's say type three is affected, then all the tissues that contain type three will be affected and then that produces clinical symptoms. Uh, two types that are, are particularly high yield, you have the classical type which affects type five collagen. This results in joint instability and hypermobility. So you often see this in patients' uh, uh, hands and fingers. And so they're able to you know, stretch their fingers uh, much beyond a, a normal individual. And then they also have skin defects. So they have stretchy skin, fragile, um, bruises easily, and then uh, ecmoses as, well, as a result of that as well. And so you can see uh, you know, collagen is such an important structural component. When you don't have that here, there, you have significant uh, structural breakdown, which is, you know, again, joint instability and then structural breakdown of the skin, which results in these, in these clinical findings as well. And then you have the vascular type, uh, which affects type 3. And remember, type 3 helps form those kind of meshwork or reticular fibers, which are a very important component of, you know, the of blood vessels. And so if you have this breakdown, or if this is uh, very weak, it can result in vascular complications, um, such as bleeding, and then aneurysm rupture, both in the cerebral circulation, which are known as bearing aneurysms. So remember in the arterial circulation, you have very high pressure. And so if the wall itself is very weak, you can have a ballooning out like this in the cerebral circulation. And these are called bearing aneurysms because, or cerebral aneurysms, because they have this spherical shape like this, and then they come down on this stem. And these are um, very dangerous uh, and you know need to be treated. They can have de devastating effects uh, on patients if they were to rupture. And then obviously aortic aneurysms where you know you have the aorta like this and then you have breakdown of the structure and you have this false false lumen out here that occurs as a result of breakdown of the aortic wall. The most common are the ones that result in hypermobile or joint instability and then you know obviously have joint dislocations. So Menke's disease this is a disease that indirectly affects collagen synthesis. So what it involves is a mutation that results in defective ATP7A uh, transporter, which is also known as Menke's protein. And this is a protein that helps transport copper across the uh, cell membrane. And so as a result of that, you have uh, defective copper transport and absorption, and that leads to copper deficiency in many tissues. And copper is used by a lot of different enzymes in the body. And so that's where if you have a copper deficiency, then you can have decreased enzyme activity, and that's where you can have really cause problems across a number of different organs. And so in particular, it results in decreased activity of lysyl oxidase, which is an enzyme that requires copper as a cofactor. And if you remember, lysyl oxidase is involved in collagen synthesis. So we have the diagram here for collagen synthesis, and we get to the point here of tropocollagen. And so then you cross-link these tropocollagens like this, and this is catalyzed by lysyl oxidase, which uses copper as a cofactor. So if you have decreased copper, you have decreased lysyl oxidase activity, which then results in decreased collagen fibers, which as we've shown in other disorders, when you have decreased collagen can cause significant problems. And we'll talk about the clinical features on the next slide. Just real quickly, the inheritance again for all these diseases so important, could definitely show up on an exam, is X-linked recessive. So the clinical features, you have growth retardation because this affects numerous uh, organ systems. This, you know, many of these clinical features are going to reflect that and span multiple uh, organ systems. Uh, growth retardation, hypotonia, coiled and bouncy hair that looks like springs is very characteristic, anemia, arterial defects, remember that makes a lot of sense because of collagen, such a huge component of the arterial walls, and then mental deterioration. Uh, this is a disease that begins in infancy, so it starts right away at birth, and then unfortunately there's no cure, and the average age is about three years of age, and typically patients don't survive much longer than that. All right, so lastly here, Marfan syndrome, and this is due to a mutation on the FBN1 gene, which is located on chromosome 15. And again, it's uh, I wouldn't be familiar with both of these. Definitely know the chromosome number. Again, I know, it's, I know it's really annoying to have to memorize these, but they can come in handy on exams because 
it could be very clear on the question stem that it's a patient with Marfan syndrome. And then they could get down to the question, the last sentence there, and they're simply going to ask you, they could ask you what chromosome is the affected gene on. And they could just list, you know, four different chromosome numbers. And uh, you need to, if you don't know which one it is, then you're uh, just left guessing and likely going to get the question wrong. So don't get burned on that. Uh, so Marfan, so as a result of this gene, you have a defect in fibrillin, which if you remember, is a sort of a scaffolding glycoprotein for elastin in connective tissue. So you have fibrillin like this. It's a glycoprotein. And then you have elastin, which remember is synthesized very similar to collagen, where you have tropoelastin and they're cross-linked like this. And they're cross-linked like this. And then what happens is they adhere to fibrillin, which sort of sort of serves as a scaffold, and then they cross-link even more around this fibrillin, and that forms elastic fibers. So with Marfan syndrome, you definitely want to know that it's fibrillin, but as a result of that, it also affects composition of elastic fibers, which can cause connective tissue to become stretchy. Remember, elastic fibers, uh, they have elasticity, which means that they are able to stretch and then immediately reform back to their original shape. Uh, it's important in structures such as the aorta, which is under an enormous amount of pressure, pressure during systole, and then it expands and then it reforms back to its normal shape. And as we'll talk about on the next slide, the aorta is definitely affecting these patients. So as a result of that, it just becomes stretchy. and There's no any kind of force or structure to help them reform their original shape. Inheritance is autosomal dominant. Again, very important to know. Again, they, it could be very clear in the question stem that it's Marfan syndrome, and then they'll simply ask, "What's the inheritance pattern of this disease?" And you know, obviously, the answer would be autosomal dominant. And they'll list, you know, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-link uh, dominant, X-link recessive, et cetera. You get the idea. So, just examples of how they can ask that. This is an example of the concept of uh, pleiotropy. So, it's an effect in one gene results in multiple varied and disparate symptoms. And that's definitely uh, classic Marfan syndrome. There's a lot of, there's definitely characteristic symptoms, but they're across many different organ systems. And that makes sense because elastic fibers are such a critical component of multiple different organs. So clinically, these patients classically are tall. They have long arms, legs, and fingers. Uh, fingers are arachnodactyly. And uh, it's not uncommon to see these patients as uh, athletes, high-performance athletes, uh, especially in sports such as basketball or volleyball, where being tall is a, is a huge advantage. Um, so definitely pay attention to that in, uh, in question stems and then even you know, out in the real world and, world and clinical practice. Uh, they often have hypermobile joints as a result of this as well. And one th thing is the, the wrist sign. So in a normal individual who doesn't have Marfans, uh, when they try to put their fingers around their wrist, they're probably just going to barely touch versus a patient with Marfans, as you can see, they overlap like this, and that's called the wrist sign. And you can also just appreciate here the, the long uh, fingers of this individual with Marfans as well. Uh, these patients also often develop cataracts and then lens dislocations, and in that case, the lens dislocates up and out, and that helps characterize Marfan syndrome from other disorders that result in lens dislocation. That's kind of a nitpicky detail, but it can help you, uh, especially on exams sometimes, uh, differentiated from other disorders that result in lens dislocation and then myopia. And then they can also exhibit uh, pectus excavatum, which is a chest wall deformity. And then lastly, like we discussed, uh, they'll develop, they can develop uh, aortic aneurysms, definitely the most serious um, cystic medial necrosis of the aortic wall and then mitral valve regurgitation. As far as life expectancy for these patients, they can have a normal life as long as they're any kind of life-threatening symptoms such as uh, aortic aneurysms are, are treated effectively. And so it really the, the management of these patients is, is long-term and it just involves, you know, managing what other symptoms they develop such as cataracts or, you know, aortic aneurysms or other symptoms they may develop. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.